go ahead and move to a game that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> I don't. Um, Why is that? It's the Colts and the Jaguars. Oh, it's the Colts man. and the Jaguars. I don't know what happened. You know, I have the game on next to Red Zone. I'm kind of following along. And I wasn't even watching that intensely the whole time. I was watching, but not intensely because I was like, oh, we're going to win this game. We led. It felt like we were up or tied or in it for the whole thing. And then right at the end, Minshew just bam, bam, and the Colts lose. And, you know, as frustrating as this game was as a Colts fan, a lot of fantasy takeaways. I think the big storyline is obvious. Marlon Mack tears his Achilles. He's out for the entire season. And there were so many what ifs before the year. So many what ifs of, oh, what if Marlon Mack opts out? Or what if Marlon Mack gets hurt and misses the whole season? What do we do with Jonathan Taylor? Here we are, first half of week one, and it happens. And the answer to that was always Jonathan Taylor's an RB1. Jonathan Taylor's a top 12 back. And I think that proved itself to be true in this game. Just what we saw from Taylor after after Marlon Mack went out. I mean, Taylor barely was on the field in the first half. It looks like they truly were going to work him in. And after that injury, we saw Taylor come in. I mean, wasn't efficient on the ground. Nine carries for 22 yards. That's going to change behind this elite offensive line. But six catches for 67 yards through the air. Steph, how excited are you for Jonathan Taylor? Oh, very excited. I sent out offers for him. I think at every single one of my leagues, we'll see how many of them get accepted because we're playing with some smart people <laughs> that luck. also know. Yeah, I'm not I'm not trying to sell off my entire roster for Jonathan Taylor, but all systems are go go for JT. Um, shouts out to Marlon Mack, man. Sorry, that that's just brutal to see. Um, never want to take a victory lap for an inj- injury or anything like that. But Mm-mm. I mean, JT, it's the Red Sea is parted, and he's going to take off. And and but behind that elite offensive line that they do have. It was great to see on top of that for Jonathan Taylor, which was kind of bizarre to see because we didn't expect this, at least I didn't, is, is seeing six targets to the air and catching all mm-hmm. six of them for 67 yards. So a ton of receiving game work, pretty much copy and paste everything Phillip Rivers over from L.A. to the Colts, which for better or for worse for you, Alex, it uh, looks like it's going to be that way this season. On top of that, we'll talk about some of the, you know, We'll talk about Naheem Hines, but just talking about Phillip Rivers here, he also threw the ball eight times to Naheem Hines, actually threw three targets over to Marlon Mack. So all these running backs. 17 targets to running backs. Insane. That's unreal. That's like a 35% target share that running backs had in this game. So look, Naheem Hines was fantastic. He was getting used in red zone packages in this one, which I was was pretty excited to see for him. He had seven attempts on the ground, 28 yards. So running at four yards per attempt, he had a touchdown on the ground. And then, like we said, eight for eight with 45 yards and a touchdown through the air as well. So Naheem Hines. Hope you picked him up on waivers. He's going to have value for the whole season. And Steph, we were talking about this before we hopped on live. We really view this as the LA Chargers situation from last year. I mean, Phillip Rivers is an indie, and of course it's going to be slightly different, but last year you had Melvin Gordon and Austin Eckler both having value, both having a clear role. This year you have JT and Naheem Hines. Both are going to have value in a clear role behind a good offensive line. So we both were kind of in agreement that Jonathan Taylor this year is the Melvin Gordon from the LA Chargers last season, but probably some more upside where Naheem Hines is the Austin Eckler from last season. Maybe not quite as much upside, but still a very valuable role. Hines for me is what you know was a top waiver you know priority guy this week if you got him you're probably feeling really good right now because he's someone i think you can plug in for the rest of the season in ppr formats as an rb2 i think he should get six to eight carries a game with six to eight targets a game and if he turns that into production maybe he falls into the end zone in a week he's going to give you a high floor with the upside that we saw here in game one so, look, Jonathan Taylor obviously has a ton of value, but Naheem Hines is going to carry some good value as well, especially with Phillip Rivers, you know, the narrative of him checking down to the running back all the time. That clearly carried over to Indianapolis at least through one game. So, uh, look, I-, I love these these running backs for the Colts. And through the air, Paris Campbell, 6 for 71 on nine targets. Great to see from Paris Campbell. This is why you watch our mock drafts. This is a guy that we were grabbing late in every single one of our mocks for this very reason. He's a slot guy. We know Rivers loves to target the slot, and we we called it there. You know, I'm not going to take the victory lap again, overreact to week one, not trying to do that, but nine targets. 82% of snaps. He was on the field more than Hilton. Exactly. Exactly. You got to feel good 
for Paris Campbell here. He's a guy that if you didn't pick him up, if he wasn't at the end of your bench, if he's still available, put some fab on him. I think Campbell is the prototype of T.Y. Hilton. I mean, a very similar type of player. Um, and we saw, I mean, we saw them play just about the same amount of snaps. Both got nine targets. H Campbell went six for 71. Hilton went four for 53. So Hilton didn't convert on that catch rate as often as Campbell did, but Hilton was drawing better coverage. You know, you don't want to, you know, maybe I could get into the film and see exactly what happened with T.Y. Hilton in this game. I know there were a the couple of targets late that were close to being catches. You know, tight defense didn't come up with them, but I, I like Hilton to bounce back. Um, if anyone's low on Hilton, a lot of people were going into drafts, and then after a single-digit performance in week one, some people might be looking to move him. I'm, I'm happy to pick up T.Y. Hilton and throw him in my flex, and I'm also happy to pick up Paris Campbell off the waiver wire. If your waiver's cleared already and he's still sitting out there, stash him on the end of your bench and see what happens. Um, you know, Michael Pittman was barely involved in this game. I think he could get worked up as we see the season go on, but it's going to be the T.Y. Hilton Paris Campbell show here in Indianapolis. And if Phillip Rivers keeps having to throw the ball 40, 45 times a game, he threw it 46 in this one, uh -oh. there's going to be plenty of value for a ton of, a ton of pieces on this Colts team. Rivers was dealing too. I feel like how many was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different receivers had receptions in this game, and a few more had targets. So it was a bummer. It was a bummer because the Colts came out first drive. Rivers drives them straight down the field for a touchdown, and it's like, okay, welcome to Indianapolis. It's going to be a fun year, and then it just didn't quite, wasn't quite the same for the rest of the game. So a bit disappointing there. But I like them to bounce back against a softer Minnesota defense. If the Green Bay example was anything, the Colts could have a pretty big game next week.